our presenter um, is Carissa Quinn. She's Director of Scholarship at Bible Project, and today she's going to be giving a paper titled Understanding the Forsaken King, the Design and Context of Psalm 22. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm so happy to be here. Isn't this a fun day? Yeah. Um, I'm just so stoked to get to celebrate Ray and celebrate with Ray. Um, his influence in my life has been profound and impactful both uh, as a mentor and personally also um, my love for the scriptures. I guess that still is personally, in a sense. Uh, my love for God, the way I read the Bible, my career path. Um, so thank you, Ray. Um, some significant memories have popped into my head today. One was this moment in my undergrad here. One of my first classes after class, Ray pulled me aside and said, hey, um, you should speak up more in class. And I think he had read a paper I wrote, and I was very quiet in class. I was just observing. I think I was a new new Christian, and I just believed him. Amen. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> I mean, it was, a, it was a significant moment in my life and believing in myself, too. Um, and then another memory is when I was going through my PhD program, which was remote. I, I think I was talking to Ray about how I just, I don't even feel like a student because I'm remote, and he let me set up a desk in his office. <laughs> by his many books, and suddenly I felt like, oh, I'm an academic, I guess, and I'm doing this thing. <laughs> so thank you for empowering me and your influence in my life. My primary field of study is the shape of the Book of Psalms. In particular, oops. Yep. Uh, I've focused on the collection of Psalms 15 through 24 and the story that they tell. This has made me curious about reuses of lines from these psalms and what happens when we read a reuse in light of an entire psalm and also within the collection in which it stands. So the most well-known quotation from this psalm group is probably Jesus' cry at his death in Matthew and Mark, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's the first line of Psalm 22. So what does Jesus mean by quoting the psalm? and what is forsakenness or abandonment. Jesus could have expressed his pain and abandonment in a variety of ways, but he quotes from Psalm 22 for a reason. And I think there are textual clues that the gospel writers are evoking the entirety of Psalm 22. So in addition to this quotation, they also use language and imagery from Psalm 22 um, or, or that resonates with Psalm 22. They portray the crowd as uh, shaking their heads at Jesus. They say, let God rescue him now if he takes pleasure in him, a paraphrase from Psalm 22. They divide his garments by casting lots. And then there are a variety of parallel themes with uh, Psalm 22 as well. So to my mind, the entirety of Psalm 22 is in view. But Psalm 22 itself is just one moment in, uh, in a larger storyline of Psalms 15 through 24. So I wanna explore what happens when we read this one line in the Gospels in light of the entire Psalm, in light of the entire collection. This could be crazy, you guys can let me know afterwards, it's just an exploration. I'll be curious to know what you think, Ray. <laughs> so let's look at the shape and message of Psalm 22. Psalm 22 can be understood as three parts each part beginning with a petition, followed by an A, B, A structure. And um, each subsequent part intensifies what comes before. So what I mean is this first A, B, A structure has two units of motivation surrounding a central unit of distress. Is that hard to see? OK. <laughs> Zooming is good. Um, OK. Wait, let's go like this. Good? OK. So, yeah, can some, anybody know how to d use a light switch? I don't. <laughs> okay. Or invert the colors from white to dark. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I work at Bible. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I'll let, I'll let my computer screen illuminate my face. <laughs> okay, um, 
So the first unit, or the first part, is these two units of motivation surrounding a center unit of distress. The second part um, has three units of distress in an ABA structure, so there's an intensification of distress. It's as if the distress is so great, there's room for nothing else. The third part, um, there's this reversal in form from lament to praise, so there's an intensification in content, but also in form. Look at this doubled ABA, ABA, and a plus one, like Andy was talking about this morning. So there's an intensification both of um, distress, so distress grows throughout the psalm, and then it's matched by confidence and praise. So let's take a bit of a closer look at this story of Psalm 22, especially the nature of divine abandonment there. How does Psalm 22 talk about abandonment? The psalm begins with a superscript of David, so we can imagine that this is about the Davidic king's experience. Part one introduces the tragic theme of divine abandonment. But what is divine abandonment in this psalm? Notice how the author contrasts uh, words about farness and abandonment, abandon and far, with action words. Um, yeah, action words that, that God does or needs to do. Salvation, deliverance, escape. These are the things the psalmist is asking for um, or that are being contrasted with being abandoned and God being far to onlookers, they notice, they can perceive the state of abandonment, saying that um, this one is in need of deliverance and rescue. So I think this is about God's action primarily on the psalmist's behalf. And this is true in the second part of the psalm too. The psalmist needs help. So far is contrasted um, or defined as having no helper. Um, and he needs rescue from death. In the second part of the psalm, we have two units, these two A and A prime units, where the enemies are described as beasts surrounding the psalmist. And then in the middle, the psalmist's body is wasting away toward death, and he's, he's vulnerable in the midst of these enemies. And I think in the second part, that's, that's what the enemies realize as well. They see him, and as a result, they, they notice he's dying, he's vulnerable, and they apportion his garments by casting lots. So this whole scene is activated by uh, the gospel authors who portray the cohort as dividing Jesus' clothing by casting lots. Part three of the psalm shifts from uh, lament to praise, and it's one of the most dramatic reversals in the Psalter. So the, the poem shifts all because of what God does in answering the psalmist. And as a result, this brings about immense praise, feasting and worship, not just for the congregation of Israel, but all afflicted ones, the seekers of him, all the ends of the earth, all the families of the nations, um, the well-off, the dying, and future generations. In other words, everyone from everywhere and all time feasts and worship all because of what Yahweh does in answering the afflicted one. And that's, I think, structurally um, indicated by these center units. So part B at the center of both of these units focus on uh, the reason for praise and worship. So in the first one, Yahweh rescues the afflicted. The second one talks about how Yahweh is the king. So there's some connection between how um, Yahweh's deliverance of the king sets in motion the thriving that's characteristic of his kingdom. So if we're familiar with the whole story of Psalm 22, Jesus' cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, activates a story about death and deliverance of the afflicted king, or maybe deathly suffering and deliverance of the afflicted king in a way that affects all humanity. So I think Jesus' words on the cross express, yes, deep anguish, but also unrelenting trust in Yahweh's faithfulness. So it's this cry of anguish mingled with confidence. So that's Psalm 22. But what if we take one step backwards, out, outwards, one step farther away? <laughs> and see Psalm 22 within its literary context. Um, as I mentioned before, I've elsewhere thoroughly explored the correspondences among Psalms 15 through 24 um, in terms of their rare shared literary elements, namely lexemes, morphological forms of lexemes, phrases, themes, uh, their overarching structures and superscripts. And high cohesion between particular psalm pairs links them together so that the collection forms a chiasm. This is at least one structure where psalms are connected as pairs. So Psalm 22 in this structure 
is uniquely connected to Psalm 17. So similar to parallel poetic lines, uh, parallel psalms also uh, invite us to compare these two psalms side by side and look at their correspondences and differences in order to understand them better. So what do we learn when we compare Psalms 17 and 22? How are they alike and how are they different? Both Psalms have three parts, each beginning with that petition. Um, they're both laments, so they have a lot of uh, overarching similarities in terms of content, but they also correspond in terms of this movement from petition, or sorry, from motivation through distress to confidence at the end, but you can even see by the length here and uh, the detail with Psalm 22 that each of these parts is expanded, especially the section on confidence. So um, Psalm 22 goes beyond Psalm 17, intensifying the themes of both distress and praise. Uh, lexical reuse between the two Psalms also intensifies these two themes of distress and praise. So I'll just show some examples here. In Psalm 17, the psalmist confidently calls to God because he will answer. In 22, the psalmist calls to God repetitively, but there is no answer. In 17, the psalmist's heart is searched and secure. In 22, the psalmist's heart melts with fear. In 17, the psalmist is righteous among humans. In 22, the psalmist laments he's not even a human, he's a worm. In 17, Yahweh visits the psalmist at night, and the psalmist is close to the words of Yahweh. Um, in 22, Yahweh does not answer at night and is far from the psalmist's words. So this is kind of uh, what I like to do is look at these rare lexemes and then compare their use and see if they're used in a consistent, if the differences are consistent, if that makes sense. So um, this is one way that these differences are, are consistent. Uh, Lips describes the righteousness of the psalmist in 17, but the enemies gaping and mocking mouths in 22. In Psalm 17, Yahweh wields the sword against the enemies in 22, the enemies wield the sword against the psalmist. So whereas Psalm 17 uses these lexemes positively, Psalm 22 uses them um, in situations of distress. So that amplifies the distress. But the same thing happens with the theme of praise. So corresponding lexemes intensify the theme of distress and also praise or reversal and fulfillment. So in 17, the lexemes answer, listen, hide, and face occur in petitions of distress. In 22, these same lexemes are used in proclamations of fulfillment. In 17, the children of the wicked are satisfied and have life. In 22, the afflicted ones will be satisfied and have life and their children will benefit. In 17, the enemies try to bring down the psalmist to the earth. And then in 22, all of the earth will turn to Yahweh. And then finally, in 17, the psalmist hopes that he will see God's righteousness upon waking, and there's a greater fulfillment of that in 22. God has demonstrated his righteousness by delivering the psalmist, and generations will forever declare this righteousness. So I think the effect in the collection is that when you get to Psalm 22, the distress is beyond what was previously imagined in its counterpart, and so also is the confidence and praise or fulfillment. When placed on the lips of Jesus in the Gospels, his cry expresses pain beyond description, but also hope in the kingdom beyond imagination. So I think it in increases the drama of Jesus' cry. In addition to um, being paired with Psalm 17, another relationship Psalm 22 has in this collection is with this royal subplot at the center of the collection. So it comes right on the heels of this royal subplot. Psalms 20 and 21 are uniquely connected. Um, 20 is a communal prayer for the king's deliverance. 21 is a communal thanksgiving for the king's deliverance. And these two are connected to Psalm 18, which is the individual king's thanksgiving. Uh, these three are royal psalms. And then 19 at the center is a Torah psalm. So that together, uh, these four psalms uh, center on the Torah obedient king. Psalm 18 recounts David's deliverance or, or um, Yahweh's deliverance of David in cosmic terms. The earth shakes, Yahweh comes down in fire and delivers his king, establishes him as ruler over the nations. 
And uh, the rescue is grounded in this reciprocal relationship of faithfulness between Yahweh and his king. But it's not just God's faithfulness to David that is promised in this psalm. The final verses promise that uh, this faithfulness will extend to David's line, to future Davidic kings. And I think this is exactly what Psalms 20 and 21 are picking up on. So Psalms 20 and 21, they reuse a lot of elements from Psalm 18, but they hone in on this promise in a unique way. So here's the end of Psalm 18, where the king praises Yahweh. He praises Yahweh, the one who makes great the salvation of his king, and the one who shows loyal love to his anointed one, who's defined as David and his offspring forever. And you can see, I won't go into detail with this, but how Psalms 20 and 21 pick up on these keywords from this promise and use them at structurally prominent positions. So the promise is made in 18. It's um, trusted in, in Psalm 20, in this petition on the king's behalf and then confirmed in Psalm 21. And I think the result is that uh, there's an expected pattern that's established by putting these three psalms together. So now we're expecting, and we've seen that God delivers his king and he's faithful to do that. I think that's what makes Psalm 22 so devastating, is that it follows this pattern, this expectation, and the expectation fails. So. Um, yeah, I think f the failed expectations are, are a big part of Psalm 22. And in, in addition to following these triumphant royal psalms, Psalm 22 also reuses various lexemes, kind of like we've already seen, in ways that contrast with the royal psalms, which furthers the devastation. For example, uh, the royal psalms, in the royal psalms in Psalm 18, my God is used in association with God as refuge, shield, and salvation. In Psalm 22, my God is used in the context of divine abandonment. And these are the only two times that this construction, my God, is used in this collection. So it links them pretty closely together. In Psalm 20, the community prays with confidence that Yahweh would answer the king in his day of trouble, sending help. But in 22, trouble is near, help is far, and there is no answer. In the royal psalms, there's consistent rejoicing over Yahweh's salvation of his king. In 22, in the lament portion, the king's salvation is far. In 18, the psalmist praises God, saying, He makes my hands and my feet secure and strong. In 22, the psalmist says that the enemies have encircled my hands and my feet. And then finally, in 18, the psalmist says, God rescued me because he delighted in me. And then this rare phrase is picked up in Psalm 22. The enemies mock the psalmist, saying, let God deliver him, using a, a similar sounding word, because he delights in him. Uh, notably, this phrase in the final row is also used in the crucifixion account in the Gospel of Matthew. So the paraphrase there, I think, activates these shattered expectations felt in Psalm 22. So the lament portion of Psalm 22 stands in stark contrast to this uh, pattern and promise of deliverance in the royal psalms. But then, at the end of Psalm 22, the king is delivered. So at the same time that it creates more distress, it also creates this resilient expectation of deliver deliverance, confirming that pattern. I don't know if I can have that both ways, but I think that that is <laughs> what's happening. <laughs> Psalm 22 also plays a key role in the entire collection of Psalms 15 through 24. So this collection is framed by the only two entrance liturgies in the Psalter, uh, which begin with this twin question like, who may dwell in your tent and who may dwell, uh, who may sojourn in your tent and who may dwell on your holy hill? Psalm 15 describes a righteous individual who may enter the presence of Yahweh. But when we get to Psalm 24, it begins with the same or similar twin question, but now we have the whole uh, righteous community present for the arrival of Yahweh as the king. So that is a significant plot progression in this collection. And why? What's happened in the middle? 
Well, if we look at that hinge 18 through 21, we see that expected pattern of deliverance, this promise that Yahweh will be faithful to the, the Davidic king. Uh, but it's in Psalm 22 where uh, we see the deathly suffering and subsequent deliverance of the king in a way that initiates the global worship and feasting that's characteristic of Yahweh's kingdom. So I think in the storyline, it's the deliverance of the afflicted king in Psalm 22 that paves the way for uh, Yahweh's arrival as king on earth in a new and profound way among his community. So how does all this contribute to how we might understand Jesus' cry? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm thinking of this in terms of layers of context, maybe, is a helpful way to think about this. Um, and each layer could be beneficial. So in Matthew and Mark, this cry is definitely a cry of abandonment and agony, which is, is true. But it might sound only like abandonment and agony if that's all that we're familiar with. But if we're recalling Psalm 22 as a whole, this is Matthew and Mark, uh, Psalm 22, then, um, and it seems that the gospel authors are inviting us to do that, to recall the whole, then we hear a mixture of excruciating pain and cosmic level hope and trust in the rescuing activity of Yahweh. And we might recall that this story of deliverance affects everyone and initiates the expansion of Yahweh's kingdom among the nations. Perhaps the centurion's cry uh, at the death of Jesus that this is surely the Son of God is a nod to that storyline of expansion among the nations. And if we're familiar, and this doesn't just happen in Psalms 15 through 24, right? This is like a repeated storyline throughout the Bible. If we're familiar with uh, the broader collection, then we might remember that in comparison to Psalm 17, Psalm 22 is off the charts dramatic in terms of distress and confidence. So this amplifies, I think, the intensity of Jesus's words as well. In light of Psalm 22's position after the royal Psalms, um, I think the cry on the lips of Jesus, one, depicts him as the true Davidic king. Two, it also acknowledges that expectations are shattered. The promise that Yahweh would be faithful to deliver his king if this truly was his king seems to have failed. Perhaps Jesus' cry resonates with his followers' unfulfilled expectations for the Messiah. But if they know the full story of Psalm 22, they might also be reminded to withhold their judgment about this perceived failure. Jesus' cry reminds us that the perception of even the most uh, extreme and devastating circumstances of abandonment, like that told in Psalm 22, does not end there for the Messiah or for his people. And um, as a result, this cry also could communicate resilient expectations of God's faithfulness to deliver the king. Finally, the use of Psalm 22 on the lips of Jesus also has the power to evoke the broader storyline of Psalms 15 through 24, one that culminates in the arrival of Yahweh, uh, Yahweh as king um, and his presence on earth in a new and profound way. So Jesus' cry, heard in context, does not downplay the severity of his lament. He was brutally tortured, murdered, and alone, and all expectations are shattered. But for those listening closely, he may also be declaring that he is the king that the scriptures point forward to. These, I think, are the diverse threads that are held together in this profound cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Thank you, Carissa. That was fantastic. Um, if you haven't already checked out the questions, I encourage you to, um, so we can um, we can have Carissa uh, be asked our favorite ones. Um, but I'm going to start with um, the one that's at the top, um, which is: If Jesus quoted the beginning of Psalm 22, did he also intend to quote the end of the psalm? Which maybe this will be a fast answer. I'm not sure. Um, God has done it with His statement: "It is finished." I have totally wondered about that. Whoever asked that question, I don't know, but could you work that out in a research project or something? Because <laughs> it is finished is in the Gospel of John, um, and it's not in, in the other Gospels, but I have wondered about that. Um, yeah, I think it would be a really fascinating project to 
well, to do this, but more um, more in depth with the other gospels and also with the broader collection, looking at um, you know quotations of Psalm 16 in the gospels and just yeah, seeing how this whole collection works out in the gospels at large. Yeah. Great. Next question: Why did you translate verse 16, "Lion"? Do the Dead Sea Scrolls say Pierce? Oh, um, yeah. Okay. That is going to make me rack my brain for a second because I can't remember except for that there is, okay, verse 16. Wait, what verse did you say? I did. The question does say verse 16. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. Verse 16, um, in the English is 17 Mm -hmm. in the Hebrew in the Masoretic, like a lion, my hands and my feet. And I can't, Ray totally remembers everything about this and could explain it. Um, but for I think just in the work that I did, I, I felt like the most um, likely translation was like a lion rather than you. another translation is you have pierced my hands and my feet um, because I think because of the parallelism with the um, beasts. So... Um, I think as I was weighing through t- translation choices, that just stood out to me as the most likely one and had resonance with the rest of the psalm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can we view Psalms 17 and 22 as, experience, as experiences of testing of the Messiah in order to satisfy the questions of righteousness in Psalm 15 and 24? As testing in order to prove, can you say that again? Yep. Can we view Psalm 17 and 22 as experiences of testing of the Messiah in order to satisfy the questions of righteousness in Psalm 15 and 24? That's a really good question. Um, Testing does come up in Psalm 17. The psalmist says, you have tested my heart and night and found no wrong in me, I think is what it says. Um, Testing is, is a theme there in 17. Uh, I'm not sure as much about 22, if that's a theme. Um, and yeah, if we're saying Messiah, I would say the the uh, righteous individual is how that one is defined in the beginning. And we don't really learn that, well, these are all Psalms of David, so uh, the titles of David. So associated with the king somehow, maybe about the king, we, we really get that idea more in the royal Psalms. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I definitely think this is a storyline about the the Davidic king who is righteous. Testing, I would have to think about that more. There's definitely a, te- a theme of testing there. So, good good question. Okay. Um, and then the next question, how does your work on Psalm 22 bear on the servants of Isaiah 54 and 56 through 66? Oh, yeah, I mean, I think um, the themes of this, well, the theme of the, the one suffering on behalf of the many and the association um, with uh, the one who in Psalm 22 is called the afflicted one or the poor um, has a lot of resonance with the later chapters of Isaiah and how that affects the group of the afflicted or the group of the poor. So mm-hmm. I, I definitely think there's overlap there thematically. Okay. Yeah. There was a, there was a couple questions on connections to Isaiah. Oh, so yeah. Cool. Um, okay. Next, by forsaken in light of the psalmic context, did the father? I think this is referring to the Gospels. Quote: Turn his face away, or was quote the wrath of God satisfied? To use him language. Yeah, I don't think that language is used in Psalm twenty two, <laughs> um, and that that's all that. I was willing to say about that mm-hmm. because that is, <laughs> that is um, probably, a, this is probably a safe, a safe way to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, um, so I can't, I actually can't answer that question from this research about the nature of the atonement. But, um, I do think that for me, what I see happening in Psalm 22 is, um, is more, is, is less about God's relational companionship and his presence uh, in that way and more about God's action of deliverance on behalf of the psalmist. I think that is the context being uploaded in Jesus' cry, why have you forsaken me? Um, and then I, I also think that along with 
forsakenness. There's hope being uploaded. Um, so I don't, I don't um, see that connection as coming from Psalm 22. And yeah, that, that's kind of what I wanted to point out in this paper, which I know that's a really big issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question. Um, this is going to be, how does this group of psalms relate back to Psalms 1 and 2, which open the psalm? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so in many, many ways. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> uh, I think one of the primary ways that I see this collection relating back is in this subunit at the middle, the combination of royal psalms with a Torah psalm. And that's a really common pairing of psalms in, in the Psalter. So it's that identification of a royal um, king who is obedient and righteous. Um, so that, that's a huge one. Um, yeah, and righteousness is emphasized throughout this collection. Um, and yeah, the collection as a whole focuses on, on how Yahweh's kingdom comes about through the deliverance of the righteous Davidic king so I think Psalms 1 and 2, you know, Psalm 1 is all about meditation on Torah and the righteous, the righteous king um, taking refuge in him, how that's, that's the good life, those things together. Um, so, yeah, I think there's, hu yeah, huge connection probably between every psalm group and Psalms 1 and 2. <laughs> but I've seen it in this one because these are the ones that I've studied. <laughs> Wonderful. Please join me again in thanking Carissa for being here.